I hope you have a real wonder during Lent because it's that special time when we see and hear such intimate details of the end of the life of our Lord Jesus. You can turn to John chapter 17 and you listen to him talking to the Father, talking about you, talking about me, praying for us. Or you can study the chapters, John 14 to 16. Some of the most powerful teaching that Jesus ever did are in those chapters. Or you can walk with Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane through his trials and to his cross. And I'm sure, Tim, that you walked along that route as we did in Jerusalem and you felt something of what our Lord went through. But tonight, I want you to feel his moments of loneliness. His moments of loneliness. First, because some of you are experiencing that. There are a number of you here who are in broken marriages. And there are times when you're desperately lonely. Some of you are single people. You live alone. And there are moments when you're desperately lonely. And I want you to hear that our Lord Jesus understands. Because he's been there. And as you go to him in prayer and share with him, you're not going to a God who's away off there. You're going to a Lord your God who's been through it. He knows. And he'll help you. And secondly, to realize together some of the tremendous suffering that Jesus went through just because he loves you. That's all. Just because he loves you so much, he suffered so much. Let's go, first of all, with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. You find in Matthew 26, and we're going to study there, Matthew 27, in verse 36 it says this, Then cometh Jesus with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And those of us who have been to Jerusalem will remember that you come out of the city and you go down the valley and across the little brook called Kidron and just as you come up on the other side, there's the Garden of Gethsemane. Apparently it was a place that Jesus often went. He went to pray, he went to be alone. But this night it was different. And as he went, there was a heaviness in his heart. And then the Bible goes on to say in the next verse, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Do you hear that? Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus who was also man, needed company in those dark moments of suffering. But the first thing the Lord showed me was the loneliness of decision. The loneliness of decision. For in Matthew 26 and verse 39 it says, And Jesus went a little further into the garden and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What's going on? Jesus battled with the thought of death. Jesus at 33 did not want to die. And the battle started in the garden. It goes through those trials and it goes right to the cross. But it's here in the garden of Gethsemane that he battles and he says, Father, if it's possible, take this away. I don't want to die. And you begin to feel what Jesus was going through. But the last part of verse 39, he says this, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. For Jesus, even in that moment as he faced death, the greatest thing was, what does my Father want in my life? Is that you tonight? Is the greatest concern on your heart, in your life, what your Heavenly Father wants for you? 
Be honest. Or is it what you want for yourself? Where are you? Can you say amen with Jesus? Lord, I don't want to go through this experience. But Father, it's what you want for me that I want. Think for a minute of the power of the will. The power of the will. Even the most gentle soul who's sitting here tonight, at times, their will takes over, and you don't move them. They're as stubborn as a mule. Nice, little, quiet soul. But the will won't budge. That's right. Our wills are very powerful. You do do what you want. <coughs> you really do. And you know and I know that in recovery from sickness our will plays a vital part. We were hearing at our minister's breakfast yesterday about a young man in Germany who was very seriously ill with cancer and he was almost in a coma and he sort of came back and forth and one day his father said, Son, people are praying for you throughout the world. He said, they are! And from then on he began to recover. They are! And you know and I know that when somebody loses the will to live, the medical world, the nurses, they'll probably lose them. But also, what about the breaking and melting of the will? We sing, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me. Melt me. And if you sing that from the heart, the Holy Spirit will begin to do just that in your life. He'll begin to break it, and he'll begin to melt it. How? Well, it happens in many different ways. Sometimes he works through the circumstances of life. And some of you are going through circumstances at this moment and God is allowing you to be broken, to be melted. Sometimes you feel the heat applied and we don't like it, but it's happening and God's doing it. Sometimes he does it through other people. Especially if you have to work with someone who's absolutely obnoxious. And then you suddenly find Jesus says, love them. Forgive them. And you say, you must be kidding, Lord. He says, no, I'm just helping you with a little melting and a little breaking. And he goes on doing that. The simple way is when I go to my Lord Jesus and say willingly, Lord, my life is in your hands. I want you to do what you want with me. And then he'll continue to break and melt, but it won't hurt nearly so much. If you're stubborn, like those Europeans, especially the Germans, <laughs> those Pennsylvania Dutch, English aren't too good either, <laughs> then we have problems. But it's not only breaking and melting, it's molding and forming the will because we also sing mold me, fill me. And if you mean it, the Lord your God by your, His Holy Spirit will begin to do just that and He'll begin to fill you and He'll begin to mold you and He'll begin to form you into the sort of person He wants you to be. I believe it's as though Jesus Christ, as he died on the cross, he looks down the centuries and he sees your life and he sees mine, and he sees the sort of man, the sort of woman that you be can become. And if we are willing, he begins to mold us and to form us to be that person. We're still us, but we're new. He takes that personality and he takes that character and he gets away the things that soil and spoil us and he cleanses us and he refines us. It's just like a potter with clay and he just forms us into that person he wants. They're a terribly thin person, but you know what I mean. 
And as he does that, suddenly we begin to see in a life the beauty of Jesus. And what happens is, the Holy Spirit who's working within begins to produce his fruit, and you find love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and gentleness, and as you go down those fruits of the Spirit, that's a likeness of Jesus. That's his work. But he will not do it unless you're willing. You can resist him, you can stop him, and God is an absolute gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He'll never push in on you. But the day you say, Lord, I'm ready, he'll move. The second thing the Lord showed me is the loneliness of isolation. The loneliness of isolation. His last hours on this earth for Jesus were total isolation. I mean, he is on his own in an incredible way. First of all, listen to Matthew 26 and verse 56, and it says, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Bright gang, weren't they? Of course, we wouldn't have been like that, would we? They all forsook him and fled. Peter, James, John, all of them. They couldn't handle it. It may just be that you've been in a situation where your Christian friends have left you. Better than I have. We've been in two church situations where those we thought we could trust until we died were not around when we needed them. And if you've ever felt us back off on friendship, that's why. We didn't know who to trust, even Christian believers. It's an awful shock. You're in this situation and you say, I could lay my life that that person would be there and the chips are down and they've gone. And Jesus had 12 men round. One had left to betray him and the other 11 forsook him and fled. Isolation. And you stand there alone. This happened for him before the Sanhedrin, the council of the Jews. You find it, Matthew 26, verses 57 to 68, it's all there. And they that laid hands on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. They accused him, they abused him, they slapped him, they spat on him, and no one said one single word for Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Nobody. Nobody spoke up for our Lord and Master. They said of him, he went about doing good. But when he stood before the council, desperate, lonely, isolation. Nobody wanted to know. Even Peter outside said, I don't know the man. He began to swear and curse as he could as a rough fisherman. And Jesus, the one we love, stood in utter isolation. And all their accusations were false. The trial was illegal. They could not hold a trial from sundown to sunset. And this was after sundown. It was all wrong. And no one said a word. And there you see our Jesus standing alone. It happened also before Pilate. You find that in the next chapter, chapter 27 and verse 11, and you can follow through that. And he's taken before Pilate, still alone, still isolated. Didn't anyone care? Where are all these friends? Not around. And you see, it's one thing to be there on trial for something you've done. But as I look at my Jesus, he's standing there for something I've done. It's not what he did. It's what you and I did. 
And he stands there. And what happened? I see that my Jesus is on trial for me. And Pilate sees his innocence. And God speaks to Pilate through his wife. And Pilate still doesn't move. In fact, he takes water and washes his hands to get rid of the guilt. But then he has Jesus flogged. When the Jews flogged, they flogged 39 times. But this was Roman flogging, it wasn't Jewish. And they just went on until the fellow could stand no more. And we saw there in Jerusalem that when they flogged, they tied the victim up by the hands and by the feet so that they were suspended off the ground. And then they flogged them with leather, with lead in the end, until the back was bleeding and men died under it. That's our Jesus. That's what he went through. Alone. Nobody cared. Who cares about him? Jesus of Nazareth. Who's he? Isolation. Suffering. Suffering for you. Suffering for me. Because he loves us so much. And then in that cell, we were taken into Caiaphas' house where he was taken that night. And we were taken right down into the, right into the cell. And as we went down, we could look down into this cell because there was a hole. And that was the only entrance. And they lowered the prisoner in. And that's where our Jesus spent his last night on the earth that he made, on the earth that he came to save. And you could go into the guard room down below and you could look through a high window and just see in. That's all there was. And I spent a lot of this week thinking and praying, Lord, what was it like? What were you doing? What was going through your mind? Were there angels to minister to you? Did you know the presence of the Father? And all I could get was this. He was alone, bleeding, forsaken. And he was there for you and me. There are times when you're alone, and so am I. There are times when you're isolated, and so am I. And you can be isolated in the middle of people. Before I left England to come to North America, I was in touch with the Samaritans. And I met the founder in London and I talked with him. He said, I've talked to two people this week. Now this is a city of nine million. I've talked to two people this week and they've said to me, can you see me? We said, yes, of course I can see you. Are you sure you can see me? I walk down the street and people are there and they look right through me until they thought they couldn't be seen. Utter isolation in a city of nine million. If you ever get into that isolation, turn to Jesus. He's been there. He understands. He knows how knows how you feel and he will lift you that's our Jesus another thing the Lord showed me was the loneliness of sin I'd never thought of this before when you sin when I sin we're alone we may sin with someone else but we're still alone shall I tell you why because you'll have to answer for it yourself. And for once in your life you won't be able to blame another soul. You will stand before the Lord God Almighty for that sin unless you've been forgiven. And sin is terribly isolating and it's terribly lonely. For Jesus it was worse. It wasn't just the loneliness of sin. It was the loneliness of the cross with the sin. And that's the horrifying part if you stop and think about it. Notice the awful fact. 
the Bible puts it like this. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. Now none of us can really enter into how that felt for Jesus. But I know this. In those moments as he died on the cross and as he cried to his father, why have you forsaken me? He lived through every sin that I've ever committed or ever will. And the same for you. Can you imagine the loneliness of that suffering, of that sin? The depth of suffering. He's not dying for himself, he's dying for us. And for the first time in his existence, he's feeling sin. Never sin, sinless. The awful fact. Also, the glorious truth. He did it for me. He did it for me. As I look and as I contemplate and as I meditate on the cross, He did it for me. And as I see that and as I think of it, I know how much He loves me. And I know how much He loves you. Because he endured it because he loves like that. Look at the cross. Feel something of the loneliness of that sin. Feel something of the loneliness of those three hours. In one of our little hymns it says this, We may not know, we cannot tell, what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us. He hung and suffered there. That's right. We don't know, Jesus, what you went through. But we do know you did it for us. The glorious truth. And then, the incredible victory. The incredible victory. You see, as you travel from the garden to the cross, the scene just gets worse and worse and worse till you get to the cross. And then finally, at the cross, in the last moments, suddenly Jesus cries out, it's finished. It's finished. What did he mean? He's saying, it's done. It's complete. As he hung there, he paid the price for sin. For God demanded a price. And the price that our God demanded was that a sinless sacrifice should be offered that sin could be taken away forever. And Jesus, on that cross, finished the work. And the debt was paid so that you and I can come to the foot of the cross and we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts as Saviour and every bit of that sin is washed away. And instead of standing as sinners, we stand totally in his righteousness, free, clean, cleansed. He's done it all. And there on the cross, we see the Lamb of God that John the Baptist talked about. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John, the apostle said, in Revelation, as he looked on that screen and saw the vision of heaven, he said, I saw uh, like a little woolly lamb, as though it had been slain, came and took the center of the universe. That was our Jesus. And what John saw in his vision is what happened after the cross, because when Jesus had died, he had broken the power of death, he had broken the power of sin, he had set mankind free, and the Lord our God gave him all power and authority. And he was placed in the central position. And that's where he is tonight. He's our Lord. He's my Lord. And he has total power and total authority in heaven and on earth. That's our Jesus. Let's pray.
Father, it seems ridiculous to just say thank you. But there's nothing else we can say. Because as we survey the wondrous cross, we find you've done it all for us. And it destroys our pride and makes us very humble. But how we thank you. How we thank you for the willingness of our Lord in the garden to die for us. How we thank you that he was willing to go through that isolation of the trials to suffer for us. And how we thank you for that final sacrifice that has set us free and made us new creations. We just say thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask that if anyone in this building has never publicly come forward and accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you do that tonight and kneel here. And as you do, just picture yourself kneeling at the foot of the cross of Jesus, who gave everything for you. And as you come, we're going to sing from page 7, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, On Which the Prince of Glory Died. Page 7, let's sing and you come.